And now we'll hear from Fred Gepron. How do we cope when bad things happen beyond our control? Well, by bad things, we mean things which cause, cause pain and anxiety, pain and, and suffering of some sort. It could be a huge catastrophe like 9-11, or the uh, tsunami in Japan, or the current carnage in Africa. About these things, there's really nothing we can do except to pray. And our prayers really do help. They help in a very subtle way those people who are suffering, and they help us because they enlarge our hearts. It makes us more sensitive to the, to the sufferings of others. More often than not, though, the things that really get to us are on a more personal level. You know, the suffering in Africa is terrible, but what really gets to me is a betrayal. Uh, suffering over there is terrible, but on the other hand, I'm going through a divorce. Or I have an illness that seems unfair. Or the illness... Or uh, a couple of notes about what I will be saying later oh. in the day. I'm going to be referring to Sri Nisargadatta quite frequently, and in case you don't know much about him, he was a jnani, a knower of Brahman, who lived in Bombay and passed away approximately in 1980. I'm not quite sur sure. But his students produced many books of his um, spur-of-the-moment talks with visitors and, and uh, uh, devotees from all over the world who used to visit him in his home in Bombay. Secondly, uh, in my talks, I don't want, I I'm going to be referring to you a lot, uh, just because, first of all, it's a nice shorthand way, but secondly, because uh, in the way that Gayatri Devi. I came to Swami Ashokananda just out of my teens, had an interview with him, and I had this peculiar, startling sensation that this old monk knew me better than anyone in my very close loving family. This was very shattering to me. And so it caused me to think about a lot of things. How could he do, how, how would he, how does he know me? <laughs> um, I will elaborate a little bit more. Um, my earliest memories are of a family's life in a small English village. And my mother tells me that at the age of two, I absolutely insisted on going to Sunday school with the big girls and boys. <laughs> this was not a totally successful experiment because after about the first or second time I came back weeping floods of tears and she was very upset and said, well, you know, darling, what, what's the matter? And we'd learned the story of Moses with the baby being buried in the bulrushes to be hidden. And I came back and said, Mommy, that poor little baby when the bull." When I was a freshman in college, my older brother joined the um, Vedanta Monastery in um, Berkeley. He um, was going to the university there. And um, he, um, he found the center someplace, I think he was like 19 or 20 or something like that. And um, he um, decided to join there. Um, now at that time, this was 1964. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, you know, well, should I become a car mechanic or sell insurance or take up spiritual life? <laughs> so I think, most people know that at some point, you know, your heart becomes heavy and you're looking for some, something more meaningful in your life. And you're just searching everywhere and you're searching mostly outside because depending on your tradition, the Western tradition mostly does direct us outside. But eventually, you have the good luck to find something very, very appealing. And this is what happened. Um, I grew up in a Catholic family, possibly with one of the best sets of parents in the whole Western Hemisphere. And I was brought up, you know, educated by the nuns for 12 years. But the very idea of being a nun was abhorrent to me. 